a good number of you joined, so welcome. Um, I think it's probably a good time for us to, to kick things off. The, the webinar that we've got today, some of you will have been on the webinars that we've been running throughout, throughout lockdown, throughout the pandemic. Um, and we've been running a lot on, on how to survive the pandemic, how to, um, how to get our businesses to, to, to survive, to, to maybe even in some cases thrive. Um, we've run a lot on topics around um, looking after your employees, particularly around mental health. But this one on leadership, I see very much as being the first webinar that we've run in this series about looking, looking up and out, um, you know, what's, what's ahead of us. Um, I, think, I think leaders have been under pressure over the last 18 months, like, like possibly never before. Some of us that have gone through previous recessions, I think maybe have seen something something similar, but nothing in any way like this, where um, you know where we've all been through a serious lockdown and you know, serious threat of illness. So I think it's it's really important now that we start to look up and out. Um, Ian and I have known each other for a long time, and I know that very much Ian is all about the role of leadership in businesses and and, and particularly passion for smaller businesses. Um, so this is how to get ahead as things open up. Um, Ian, as I mentioned, we've known each other for a long time. Ian's an executive coach. He's my executive coach. We've been working together, what, for three years, four years? Yeah, long yeah. yeah maybe, long time. maybe longer. I don't know. I always underestimate how long I've worked with people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Ian's a, say, a very experienced executive coach. He's, he's got a lot of ex a lot of business background. Um, he's a TEDx speaker, so he um, gave a very, very popular talk on, on TEDx, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, and he's also the author of the book, The Leadership Map, um, which is, is sort of, is, is kind of we're going to use as the framework today for, for the content. Oh, and I should also say uh, he's got a, a very popular podcast called The Gritty Leadership Club. And, and grittiness or grit is something that we'll touch on later. Um, that podcast is with um, with another person that we know well, uh, Ben Wales. So, um, Ian, I've given you a little bit of background. Give give us something about yourself. Well, um, married with two grown up kids. Um, uh, I'm at that stage where they're both leaving home. They're 19, so they're going to university, which is always a sad part of our lives. Um, but I spend most of my 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 days with leaders. Um, so. Some of the stats uh, make me think I'm probably doing too much, but then when you love something, it's uh, hard to stop things. So I coach about 40 leaders, CEOs, key executives. Um, in the last two and a half years, um, speaking to Vistage, which is groups of CEOs and key executives, I've done about 90 speaker workshops, um, which, which, which is three, been three hours in length on all subjects around leadership. Uh, as you said, I do, the, I do the podcast with Ben Wells. I blog every month. Um, uh, and I do leadership programs. At the moment, I've got three leadership programs uh, running across uh, different companies, uh, all SMEs, and uh, one new client just opened up in Singapore, which is really interesting. So loads of stuff around leadership. And, and, and like many, I'm sure on the call, I spend a huge amount of time also absorbing and growing myself because the thing is with this subject, you, you never know it all. And the, and the more you know, the the, the less you believe you know so you know absorbing podcasts myself reading watching um and trying to trying to grow grow my knowledge of this interest really interesting subject yeah yeah absolutely good stuff all right brilliant thanks for that um a couple of bits i i forgot to touch on in the uh, in the housekeeping um we've got the chat going which a bunch of you have found already so that's that's great news um, we've also got the Q&A section. Um, love to take your questions as we go. So we'll, um, we'll be constantly looking at the Q&A. So if you've got a question, if you want to give you clarity, um, then, then please drop the question in. Um, if you see me a lot looking to the right-hand side, it's because I've got my screen open with all the, the chat and the Q&A, everything. It's not because I'm doing my Facebook. Um, so uh, that, that's there. So please interact with us um, very much. This is, this is kind of a, you know, a chat and, and we want to take it where it's going to be most useful to you. But just as a way of, of kicking things off, Ian, what, how have you seen, whilst this is a forward looking thing, I think it's interesting to mm -hmm. recognize how have you seen leaders react, respond, change due to lockdown? 
Mm. You notice any trends? Um, yeah, I noticed trends kind of they changed through through lockdown. I think um, when people went into lockdown, uh, it was really important for leaders to grasp what was going on, as Jim Collins would say, the brutal facts, you know, what's happening. And I think some people got caught off guard. Some people were really up to uh, what was going on um, and to create scenarios about what, what might happen to their businesses and then react uh, accordingly to one of them, engage their senior leadership teams uh, and engage their whole organisations. I think the ones who communicated really well and of course, it became a different form of communication, didn't it? It became this sort of communication over screens, which is you've got to work a, lot, work a lot harder. I know I did a lot of presentations on Zoom and it was way harder to do this and engage people and know they're engaged with you. So I think leaders, leaders had to get used to that. I think they put a lot of technology in if they were smart and, and, and they looked at homeworking. Um, and a lot of the things we, we put in place aren't going away now. And I think... Um, we realized we were going to have to be creative. We were going to have to look at opportunities. Um, we went through all the emotions, didn't we? And leaders were no different. There was, there was, there was the, the denial, the fear, the anxiety. Um, and as leaders, the best ones came out and were as clear as they could be about the situation we were in, how we were going to manage it, where we were going, that our vision was still valid, that we had a real underlying purpose, that we were going to work according to our values. And they created some assurance for people. People needed that because for a lot of people, and, and there is still that going on now, of course, and I've been talking a lot to, to groups this week about the fact that we're kind of coming back. We feel we're coming out of the pandemic, but we're not really. The pandemic's still there. The COVID's still there. It's not going away. And people are still anxious. So there's never been a more important time for leaders to communicate, to have clear messages to um to, to to really reiterate where we're we going as a business and what we're trying to achieve and get them back to some of the basic things um and so yeah i see i see the best leaders doing that they've taken their people with them uh, it's extraordinary what some leaders have done i've seen i've seen leaders come out of this a lot of leaders come out of this in a better position than they went in and 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 that makes no sense when you think of some of the challenges we've had and you know, uh, I, I know organisations where they furloughed 900 people out of 926. And, and you think, how did they survive that? And, and that organisation I'm thinking about, which was Team Sport Indoor Go-Karting, um, run by the exceptional Dominic Gaynor, um, I've come out flying. And um, because of his exceptional leadership, you know, he did exactly what I said. He, he scenario planned, he put videos out there to his teams, he constantly communicated, he kept people in touch and constantly, constantly, constantly kept people focused on where this business was going and reassured people. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fascinating that the the biggest change that we made to get into lockdown was forced on us. So it was change management overnight and we yeah. made that massive change. But now the challenge is actually how do we come out yeah. and there's going to be no forced coming out. So um, yeah, absolutely. I take that. But the the, the term we, we've used the word a lot: leadership. What, mm. what what is a leader? Is it nature or nurture? Is it introvert, extrovert? What's the difference between a leader and a manager? There you go. Throw a whole load of questions at you. Yeah. <laughs> Pick whatever you will from that. Um, so I think there are a few. I might I say natural leaders. Um, uh, that doesn't mean they can't learn and grow and become better leaders. I think that's what every person needs to do. I think most leaders I work with, and I'm very privileged to work with a lot of leaders, um, one day they're a manager and they get trained in management. Lots of management courses they go on, and which are very about controlling things and running things and operationals and uh, um, P&L and balance sheet and all that stuff. Then they're, then they're promoted maybe to the head of a team, head of a department, maybe CEO. And they sit there and they go, what am I supposed to do? Which is what I did when I became an MD of a company uh, back in 97. And I thought, what on earth do I do now? You know, I'd done an MBA, but that didn't help much. Um, and I think that's the thing. I mean, if you look at people like Peter Drucker, they've kind of defined the two, management and leadership. And management's about the sort of control and making things happen, implementing things. It's, it's quite left brain. And leadership tends to be more about the vision, being creative, challenging the status quo, developing and growing the people around you. You know, those are the sort of traditional ways of dividing the two. 
In terms of introvert, extrovert, I mean, that's an interesting one. I think you'll probably find, you know, if I sit with the, the groups I work with, they're probably split 50-50. I don't see any advantage to being an extrovert necessarily as a leader versus an introvert as a leader. And, and if we look at the kind of science behind introvert extra, extroversion, um, you know, introverts tend to think things through a lot more before they say things, and extroverts tend to say things while they're thinking things through. Um, and uh, there are a huge number of introverts who are really successful leaders. I, I think, unfortunately, in the press, we kind of focus on the extroverts because they're the ones that tend to get our attention. Um, but no, I think it's really split down the middle. Split down the middle. Yeah, absolutely. OK, good. Look, let's let's dive into um, some of the concepts around the leadership map. Now, if I understand it correctly, the, the book was very much your your way of distilling everything you've learned over the years and the examples and the the, 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 the things you've seen in practice about what what makes a great leader, maybe actually how to become a great leader. And I see we've got a question in can leadership be taught? Uh, you know, is it? Is it innate? And it's a, it's a combination, I think, isn't it? It's, it's a bit of both. Definitely and cool. if yeah. I see your, your book, it's a little way of saying, right, let's bring, bring a whole bunch of tools, a whole bunch of examples into one place so it can be very much a, a, a reference guide. Um, and the, the, the start of the map, the start of the journey is what you call the, the strategic decision filters. Yeah. Um, so what, what are they? What, how, how, does it, how does it begin? Yeah. Um, so when I when I started putting the book together, I, I wanted to figure out well, what's the order. You know, what what comes first? If you're starting a business, what do you what do you need to put in place first? Um, and um, so I, that's why I put these four together: um, purpose, vision, values, and strategy. And, uh, and why are they strategic decision filters? Why do they call them that? Because when they're in place and you're very clear, they help you make decisions. So let's start with the the first one: purpose. Um, uh, if you look at Disney, huge, uh, pick a big example first, Disney, creating happiness is their, their purpose. If you, if you go and Google it, you can find it. They say our purpose is create, creating happiness. As a decision filter, what does that mean? It means that when I'm, a, I'm in a park and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing customers around me, um, or guests as they call them, um, I want to make them happy, whatever I can do to make them happy. That's my purpose. I might have a job. But if I'm on purpose, I'm doing that, I'm making them happy. If we're producing a film, we're making people happy and so on. If you go to uh, an SME, again, I'll pick Team Sports. I work with them a lot, like I, 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 I work with Breathe. Um, it's creating unique and exciting experiences for everyone. So again, they can look at that as a decision and filter and say, is everyone, is everyone coming in? Have we got something for everyone here from, from kids right the way through to, to grandparents? Are our experience is still unique or are the competition now doing something we're doing so how unique do we keep it um are they exciting are they exciting enough um are they too exciting you know we've we got health and safety in there so as a purpose um you can have an individual purpose you can have an organizational purpose so for me it's interesting when i started this journey all those years ago i started thinking i remember actually i met a guy called brad waldron who met who you'll know well you've used him in breathe um, great Australian speaker. He, he spoke at our last conference. Fantastic. I, I love Brad. He's superb. He spoke to a group of CEOs I was working with. And at lunchtime, I sat next to Brad and I said, uh, that was a great session, Brad. What? And I just said, what keeps you going? What keeps your energy here? Because he's a guy with huge energy, as you'll know. And he said, well, do you know, Ian, it's because I'm on purpose. And it stopped me in my tracks, him saying that at the time. And I thought, I said to him, what do you mean? He said, because this is what I do. This is what gets me out of bed. And if you think of being a nurse or a doctor or a fireman, you automatically think they're kind of there on purpose. They had a purpose. You know, my, my nephew, he wanted to be a pilot from the age of four. He is now a pilot. So he feels totally on purpose. And, you know, it made a big difference when I started to put my world together. I think, what do I do? And what sits at the heart of it? And, uh, and that became inspiring leadership. You know, I want to get out of bed and inspire people to be leaders. That's what I want to do. And everything I do fits around that purpose for me. So that's purpose. Yeah. There are three other bits to that. Um, you know, vision. I believe organizations can't, for example, sit down as a leadership team and decide what they're going to do next year unless they've got a longer term vision of where they want to be. Otherwise, they're just kind of building off this year. 
And so it's really important to think, and I don't think too far out. I subscribe, and I'll probably drop a few references in here. Cameron Herald wrote a book called Vivid Vision. Really like his book. It talks about having a very vivid view of what it would be like if you wake up in three years' time and your business is flying. What does that look like? And so you do need to have a view of where your business is going to be in, three, say, three years' time. I think five years is too far ahead. Three years. And then you can build your strategic priorities, your goals, your targets off that. Um, values, obviously, Breathe have got a great set of values, growth mindset being one of them. I think that often we talk a lot about values, you know, the heart of a business, the culture, the DNA, and we have to live it. We have to recruit on it, induct on it, appraise on it, do our one-to-ones around it. You know, the behaviours are so important. <clears throat> and then finally, strategy. Now, strategy was the interesting one for me because when I started putting together a, a chapter on strategy. And if you start Googling strategy, there are a million different versions of what it is, you know? And some people you say, what's strategy? And Ben and I have discussed this on a podcast. And uh, if you say to some people, what's strategy? They'll tell you everything from mission to vision, to purpose, to strategy, to strategic priorities, to meetings. And uh, you'll say, well, that's fair enough, but you know, okay, but what strategy? So I went back to Michael Porter uh michael porter was the guy that i studied in uh, at henley all those years ago and he said it's su your sustainable competitive advantage so for me strategy was about how you are different from the competition and how and can you and sustaining that over time right so with that in mind my view on strategy which i put in the book is around what some people might say is positioning it's, you know, so you've got to be good at everything to run a good business, but where are you going to be exceptional? And that can be about product excellence. It can be about customer intimacy or operational excellence. And I think, you know, I mean, if you look at Breathe, I know you're going to say you're much more about customer intimacy, but you've got those other things which you've got to do well too. So to me, it was about getting people to focus on We've got to be really good at some things, but where are we going to be different from the competition? And that applies if you're a coffee shop on the high street or if you're Tesla. You know, it, it really does. Yeah, yeah. These things apply to SMEs as well as the big the big guys. It's just just when we move on, um, but let's just step back for a second. We've had a question from Alison, and I think it's a really useful one is just focus for a second or two on the difference between a purpose and a vision. Right. Yeah, that's a great. And I get asked that all the time. I would say a purpose grounds us into why we do what we do, why we exist. Um, it's not about where we're going. So I would say the purpose grounds us to, it's the Simon Sinek thing, um, where it, a great TED talk, if you haven't seen Simon Sinek's Start With Why, The Golden Circle, he talks about people buy why you do what you do, not what you do, they buy why you do what you do. And I think with businesses, it's the same thing. When you can walk into a pitch and say, why we exist at Breathe is to do this. Why we exist at Tesla is to do this. Why we exist at Disney. And you can get passionate about that. So that's why we exist, why we came together. And often as the founder of an organization, you may not have written it down, but it's in your head. And you kind of need to extract the juice out of it and put it down. Um, the vision is different. The vision isn't why you exist. The vision is where you want to be in, say, three years' time. Um, there is a useful, I mean, I find it's, uh, the purpose thing is harder. These things are hard, by the way. I mean, I can spend, you know, a, a, a half day to a day with, with leadership teams trying to figure out, help them to articulate their purpose or their vision. And so these are hard things to do. One of the things I came across is, um, well, first of all, I came across a book called The Blue Zones, which talked about the people who lived the longest around the world, centigenarians. One of the areas they looked at was Okinawa, the Japanese. And Japanese in Okinawa lived to a ripe old age. And one of the reasons they say they live to a ripe old age is because they have a real purpose. And they have this thing called Ikigai. And Ikigai stands for a worthwhile life. And Ikigai has four parts to it. It's really useful. I use it for organizations and senior leadership teams to try and find their purpose. So these four areas they have is what you love, what you're passionate about, what the world needs, and that comes back to kind of like your products and services, what you're really good at. So there's no good saying, well, the world needs this, we're not good at it. So what you're really good at, and then what you can be paid for. 
So the sort of economic engine that Jim Collins talks about in the headshot concept. So those four things are quite nice to sort of reverse engineer what might sit at the, the heart of them, which is the purpose. So purpose is who we are, why we exist. A vision is where we want to be. Brilliant. Okay, great. Hopefully that, that answers answers your question. And it, you know, I think I think just to wrap up this part of the section, I, I personally found that it's okay not to know what your purpose is. It's okay not to know what your vision is. Maybe even not to actually have written down your values, so long as you're on the on the road to finding them out, to to writing them down. And we at Breathe, we've we've been through in the the, the years we've existed, we've been through a number of different versions of, mm. um, of of purpose and vision. And our values have changed as we've grown. They've they've um, they haven't changed drastically, but maybe we've refined them. We've honed them. Uh, we've developed as we've grown. Um, I agree. These things aren't set in concrete. People often ask me that, you know, can I ever change my values? Yes, of course you can. You can, you can, yeah. you're more likely to tweak your values rather than change your values, but your vision must be looked at regularly. Um, and your purpose just might be tweaked a, a little bit to say, you know, uh, the point is you've got to be using these things, looking at them, th thinking about them. You know, when you came in, when many organizations came into the pandemic, they said, as a decision filter, what does our purpose tell us we should be doing? What do our values tell us how we should be acting? How does our vision help us to move through this pandemic? So a lot of great organizations were using these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of really good questions come in. Um, can you have a vision without a purpose? Uh, well... Do you know, some people have a kind of a mish, a mashup. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen some organisations who've got a purpose and a vision in one sentence. And you know, I'm, I'll be very pragmatic about this. If it works for you, and you kind of put it into one thing, great. But think about it. Think about mm. what would be useful. You know, when I when I put the book together, my my. My point was there, make something practical and useful. Don't say you have to do this. You have to call it that. You know, I've got people saying, well, we call it a mission and not a purpose. So, well, that's fine. You know, in fact, you don't need to call it either of those two words. I remember working with a senior leadership team and it got to lunchtime on an away day. And we were using purpose and vision and strategy and strategic priorities. And the CEO of the groups said after lunch he said ian we've got to stop using this management bs and i said <laughs> i said great tell me more he said it's fine for us here but when we go out to our staff uh, and that's not to say they don't understand this stuff but we're taught that we're going to turn them off so what they said is we're going to we're going to go out there and actually say why we exist is to and then at, at what they decided, where we want to be is, and then what we decided, how we're going to behave is, and what we decided, our values, and how we're different, our strategy. They didn't use any of the classic uh, management don't. terms. And I thought, great, you know, do you know what? There are no real rules here. If it works for you, if you don't, if you can, if you can put a purpose in with a vision, all I would do is say, think about it. Think, yeah. have a conscious choice. Yeah, really good, really good. Okay, so so moving on just a step, um, the second part of the the map is around people and teams. So mm. that's that's something that's really dear to my heart. In that, you know, we very much believe at Breathe that uh, people are at the heart of the organisation, and if you look after your people, they look after the rest. Mm. Quoting Richard Branson there. Mm. Um, you kick this off really interestingly with with the idea of challenging the status quo. Mm. And I know that's sort of the center of your, your TED talk. Mm. Why challenge the status quo when it comes to your people and your teams? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And it kind of sits at the heart of my own journey, I suppose, which is why I feel so strongly about it. Now, there are some people in organizations who are very comfortable sitting in their status quo. The big question for me, which is a bit of a rhetorical one, is can people totally stay in their status quo anyway? Don't we have to move a bit? Don't we have to learn a bit? Some people learn enormously and they grow and they change and they develop. 
some people learn a tiny bit. Some people find it difficult to move outside their status quo. It's their comfort zone. And there's maybe nothing wrong with that to some extent. The danger is the more the longer people stay in the status quo, in their comfort zone, the harder it is to move them outside of that. And, you know, if you think about yourself, it, it, it can be the same. We all know people in our lives, maybe friends, maybe people, colleagues who find it quite difficult to change. Um, they, they're fearful of the change. They might make a mistake. And that brings us on to, um, you know, some, some of the great books out there like Fear Less by Pippa Grange, which is all about how we're driven by fear of, of going outside our comfort zone um, because we're fear of rejection, we're fear of criticism, we're fear of, uh, of getting it wrong, we're, you know, we're fear of losing. And um, so, but the thing is, as I've discovered personally, so when I did my TED talk, which you, you talked about earlier, my TEDx, um, I was the most nervous I've ever been. And when I applied to do that, I, I was way outside my comfort zone. I never saw myself. The story I told myself was, this is for other people. I don't do this kind of thing. And then I found myself doing it because I thought, no, I've got to live the message I'm putting out there. I can't, I can't not do this. So, and I had a message I wanted to put out in, in, in the TEDx I did. And um, I was really, really nervous. And I remember, st I can remember vividly standing at the back of the room um, doing an Amy Cuddy power pose before I went because it was all <laughs> dark at the back and nobody could see me and I came to the front and got up there and I did it and it and it went okay I got away with it as they say and but afterwards do you know what you could have put me in Wembley Stadium with a hundred thousand people I had grown I had developed I had gone outside my my comfort or my or my status quo into my stretch and I had grown as a person and I think the biggest thing as a leader and you'll know Jonathan about this because you care passionate about people and you want to grow your leadership team. The biggest, the biggest thing about being a leader, I think, is to see somebody change and grow in front of your eyes and look at them. I think I, I've been a part of that, even a small part of that. And they blossom, they've grown, they're having new conversations, they're reading new books. And that for me is the journey I'm on and I love. And I love to see somebody say, you know, they've started off, they didn't know what TED was, they haven't read many books, they don't go onto podcasts, they don't do a lot of learning, they've done a little bit. And then a couple of years later, they're saying, oh, do you know, I just uh, just heard Brandy Brown's podcast with uh, Jim Collins, fascinating. We have a conversation about it, and they're applying that in their world, in their business world. Yeah. I love that. So this, this business of going from status quo to stretch to getting outside your comfort zone, I think it's really important for all of yeah. us. I think... I think there's one there that we can tie tie back in. It's very, very relevant to now with with us all starting to come out of lockdown in that I'm a big believer if people stay in their comfort zone for a long time, their comfort zone actually gets smaller. So if we're all locked down and in our houses and it'll be at working from our houses, um, it's very real. People are not used to doing the things that two years ago they'd have thought nothing about. Yeah. So I think as leaders, as we start to, to encourage people back out and, and the things that are going on that we used to do as a given, mm. we need to actually be well aware. We need to put ourselves in the other person's shoes and say, actually, this isn't so so normal for you now. Yeah. Um, we, and the only way they're going to do that, I think kind of building on this, and it, it ties into the, the vulnerability and the trust and all those other things I've spoken about, is you've got to create a safe safety net for people. You know, if you're a leader, you can't just expect people to jump and, and do things which are which are way outside their comfort zone. They won't do it unless you've created this this safety, as Simon Sinek talks about a lot, this sort of safety for people. Um, and you're going to create that through developing trust and having great conversations with them and feeling they've got their back and not criticizing people when they try something and they maybe fail. Actually, the word yeah. is, that's just feedback. Um, so you have got, you know, people won't just do this on their own. There's a question come in um, from from Lawrence. Why are we always trying to push employees out of the box or out of their comfort zone? You know, why are we obsessed with constant change? Um, if we've got people who are happy to stay within their comfort zone, isn't that okay? I think it is okay, and I think uh, for some people, and this is very individual. It's a bit like motivation. You can't you can't sort of I'm going to motivate everyone today. It doesn't happen like that. You have to look as a leader. You have to look individually at the people you've got. And, you know, some of them, uh, a really small change would be something that's fine for them. And you know what? They come in, they do a great job for you. They, they do nine to five. Absolutely fine. 
the the anxiety can step in as if they think they're supposed to step outside their comfort zone or they're supposed to be stretching themselves or they're supposed to be doing all this stuff and so it's it's an individual thing uh, and, and Lawrence is absolutely right for some people they're so driven to want to keep keep stepping outside the comfort zone and do more those are maybe your a players who you've really got to have a plan for and you've got to help them get there and give them more challenging jobs and they'll really grow your business. But I, I completely agree with, with what Lawrence is saying there, which is you can't have an organization with everyone constantly running around, getting outside their, their comfort zone or, or, or the status quo, because it would be, it'd be chaotic. And, but the good news is you won't find loads and loads of people who want to do that. In fact, the people who really want to stretch and grow your business are, are probably a minority of people. The vast majority of people want to stretch and grow a little bit, which is normal for all of us. Um, and there are some who don't want to do it at all. And I think personally, that's a bit of a danger if they if they really don't want to do it at all. I think even small changes, small bits of growth, you know, re reading a bit here, listening to a blog over here, before you know it, you've got new concepts, new ideas. You're starting to push yourself a little bit. So I think it's... Um, it is a bit dangerous kind of at that end if people aren't growing at all. But I agree with the sentiment. You know, most people in organizations grow a little bit and there are some who want to grow a lot. And they're the ones who probably help take our organizations forward much faster. Yep. Yeah, no, I get it. But but great, great question and, and very valid. Mm. Um, moving on slightly um it's still still staying within people and teams you talk about the dream team mm. what's what's the the concept of a dream trip can't even say it dream team <laughs> well it was um it was a kind of combination of bringing together you know i've been a big fan of patrick lencioni's work for years um and uh five dysfunction of the team it, it was a book I, I i i will keep recommending to people all over the place uh, and I still do. Um, what I added to that was was things like safety, uh, which I've talked about already, um, and building on Lencioni's view, he talks about vulnerability-based trust, um, which is key. Um, I, I, and I think I've all, all, already mentioned Brené Brown, who's fantastic, great TED Talk if you're interested in vulnerability, trust. She talks about shame. Um, uh, fantastic speaker, great podcast. She interviews some fantastic. It was a great resource for people to go into, and she she really unlocked um, the whole world of vulnerability for me, which is going back to our sort of earlier conversation about stretch. Um, when we're going outside our comfort zone, we're being vulnerable. Whether that's telling people that we are not coping well in the pandemic and we feel anxious about returning to work or whether that's standing on a stage and talking about breathe to a big conference. Both of those are being vulnerable. Both of those build ourselves uh, as human beings and both of those mean we can probably go again. What they do is they build trust between people. So if I open up with you, Jonathan, and we've opened up a lot in our conversations over the past, we know each other really well, guess what? That builds trust between us. Yep. And that trust means we can turn around and challenge each other quite openly. And we do. You know, I'll challenge you in our coaching conversations. You'll challenge me back on what I've said. And we can do that because we've got this real basis of trust between us that's built up over the years, over showing some vulnerability and showing who we really are. When the challenge comes to play and the challenge is put on the table and think of a leadership team we've now built up the trust around the table we're open with each other we've put some really challenging questions there and we've talked about the most important things we could talk about today and that's the that's a great question for a leadership team you know what's the most important thing we could talk about today rather than the agenda we came in the room with um and let's not have, I can't remember who it was listening to today, she said, the worst organisations having have a meeting after a meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and we should never have a meeting after a meeting. We should have the meeting in the meeting. We should have the conversation right. in the meeting. So 
when we've got the trust, when we've got the vulnerability there, when we're open with each other, we'll, uh, we get the proper conversations on the table, we challenge each other. What happens when we challenge each other? We get deep into a real proper conversation that affects our business in a real way. We come to real actions out the back of it that we're passionate about. Len Shani says we don't weigh in, we don't buy in. So we have to weigh into a conversation. And we get those real actions that come out. And then what happens is we all want to see them pursued because we've all bought in. We've all had that discussion. It's a real issue for the business. We want to see them pursued and we want to see actions taken. So guess what? Commitment and accountability just flow out of those conversations. Obviously, we need a process in there that says, well, I'm going to follow up with you. But people are committed because they've done it in a team. Peer accountability is so much stronger than me holding you accountable because it's the group. The group come back together and say, did you do that? Did it happen? Yep. And out of all that, you get great team results. That is my team excellence model that I've just described there. And that is a dream team. If you can create that, which is, it sounds easy, doesn't it? It's explaining it in a model like that. Um, it's explained brilliantly in, in Lencioni. Sinek talks about the safety. Brenny Brown talks about the vulnerability as well as Sinek, uh, as well as Lencioni, sorry. So, uh, but a model like that really is at the heart of trying to create a team that is high performing. Yeah. Um, question that just came in there um, from Andy. Didn't catch the name of the book. I think the the time when you when you asked the question. I think it was Patrick Lencioni, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Um, yeah. Awesome book. I've got it on Audible. Yeah. Listen to it every six nine months. Yeah. A really yeah. good book. Really good one to listen to. Yeah. Okay, a um, couple more questions that I just want to cover off. Um, Laura saying, how do you identify your A players? Controversial term, because that's suggesting a hierarchy. I know it was a term that you use, so I'm not, I'm not saying you uh, are. I know, I know. I, you, you, you've got to be careful, haven't you? Um, well, I think that uh, A players almost always identify themselves to you, I would say. Um, a players are usually the ones who come into your office and say, I've got a great idea. I want to, uh, how about we do this? Um, they've got lots of energy. They've got lots of ideas. Um, and they want to achieve stuff for you. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of almost entrepreneurial in their spirit. They want to get on and they understand the vision and where you're going. Um, they might have, they might be, you know, they might have too much energy and, and not enough structure in some ways. Um, and some of them would need to be held back a bit and they'd need to be made sure that what they're doing is in line with where we want to take the business and they don't go off on a tangent. Um, but, you know, you, if you create the environment for people, if you create the environment of creating safety and, and, and you challenge people and you support people and you show you care for people as a leader, that creates the environment for A players to come up and stand out. Um, and, you know, when you recruit, you can see that uh, if you've got a great recruitment process, you can see, wow, this person's really going to add something here. They've got something extra. Um, and, and you should be able to see it through the recruitment and the induction process. And they'll begin to take your business in the direction you want. And uh, as I said earlier, you can't have everyone, but then you won't find tons of these people around. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I always try and hang on to with the idea of sort of ABC players, whatever, is that, that, that an A player isn't fixed. Somebody's yeah. not, you know, if they're an A player now, they don't always have to be an A player and that's, that's perfectly good. So there's a couple of things I know that you're, you're big on is, is the idea of Jim Collins, right person, you know, right people on the bus and then in the right seat. Yeah. So you can get somebody who's right for the organization, but they may be not in the right seat. Yeah. And they're not doing the right role or, you know, something needs to change. Absolutely. But the other thing that I feel really strong on as, as, you know, as I do around the idea of people first is situations change. Yeah. Somebody who's with me today and is an A player, their situation is going to change. Life goes up and down. You know, um, we, we start families, we, mm. we go through different stages in our lives. And just because somebody is not an A player today doesn't mean to say they can't be. Uh, be an A player tomorrow. Um, Absolutely. So and B players become A players and A players become B players and C players, if we're going to go that far, who maybe aren't performing very well, they may be a bit dissatisfied, they may be a bit demotivated, they may be spreading disharmony. Do you know what? They can become A players too. 
It's our job as leaders to look across the piece and say, what have we got here? How do we help people? How do we motivate them? It's all very individual, but I've seen C players, you know, that people might not use that term, but people really who aren't performing very well become A players because they've had development, care, attention, motivation put on them and a really good lot of one-to-ones and attention. And suddenly they've woken up, they've, they they feel they're cared for and they, and they change the spots as it were and is the question coming from annette if i sort of paraphrase it slightly is um is it that the a players get all the attention and all the all the special treatment how do you how do you maintain the fairness is it about fairness um yeah it's a great question i mean i so, so to be honest, you're not going to get a huge amount of A players, I don't think, in an organization. But you do need to have a plan for them. You do need to manage them and lead them carefully. You do need to have one-to-ones with them because they're going to make a difference in your organization. However, you know, leadership's tough. I think I say that probably in the book. You know, if you're doing leadership really well, um, it's really hard. Because you, you can't just focus on the A players. You've got to focus on your organization. You've got to communicate really well. You've got to care for lots of people. One of the things as a leader, you, you can't have too many people that, that re- directly report to you. You know, that's another. I'm working with a company at the moment, and the CEO has got 11 people reporting to him. Now, that's tough. You know, how can you do one to one to 11 people and develop? And, you know, I always think five, six is probably the maximum as, as, as a leader. But with those five, six, let's say you've got a couple of real A players in there. Of course, you don't ignore the others. You've got to have regular one to ones. And that's a passion, passionate thing about you, you, Jonathan. And all the stats would, share, would say we've got to be checking in with people weekly and discussing informally and giving them feedback and praise and talk to them about what they're doing well and, and what they perhaps could improve upon on a, on a weekly basis. And so you've got to be thinking about your A players because if they go, you know what it's like, somebody who you, you, you take for granted, who's doing really well, who you're loving in your business, comes in and said, I've got another job. Because the thing is about an A player is they can go and work for lots of people. They're really good. And so financially and strategically, you don't want to lose too many A players. So you have got to pay attention to them. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you don't pay attention to the others. You know, you've got to do both. You've got to do this. You've got to do both as a leader. I think I think maybe sometimes being an A player in an organization can be potentially the unfair place to be because if you're in there and you're saying, give me more, give me more, give me more, I want, I want more responsibility, I want more pressure, that you can get an unfair amount of work to do. Um, but that's somewhat what the, the yeah. person who chooses it's their moment to to you know, that's what they have to put up with. Yeah. Look, um, so much to cover again. You, you touched on the subject of one-to-one, which sort of takes me on to um, onto the idea of, of meetings, mm. <laughs> um, which, you know, every, um, every organization, they have their meetings and uh, meetings, good or bad. Start with that question mark. Uh, yeah. I mean, Meetings for an awful lot of organizations are awful places to be in. They just, that you know, and I always say the interesting thing about meetings is, and I, I, when I, 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 we were chatting earlier and I said, I said to you, I just ran a full day workshop with a leadership team on how to run meetings. And I started off by saying, this is not a sexy subject, but it's so important. And we ran the day and I got great feedback and they're implementing a lot of stuff. So meetings aren't done well in a lot of organizations. Why is that? I don't think people are trained in what a good meeting looks like. I think the danger is one day you're in meetings and your boss is running them. And that's how you think meetings are run. And if they're, if your boss isn't running good meetings, you're kind of like, there's my standard. It's like, OK, well, that meetings aren't necessarily good then. And so you carry on. But actually, there are frameworks, there are tools, there are techniques, there are ways of running a meeting. The best bit of advice I've ever got about a meeting, and we can talk about meetings all day, as I did recently. Um, there are all sorts of types of meetings you should run from tactical to strategic, and you should never mix tactical and strategic together. And you've got daily huddles, and you've got weekly tacticals, and you've got monthly strategic, and you've got off-site retreats. So there's lots of different meetings. But probably the most interesting about me is how do you run a great meeting? For most people, they go, how do I run a great meeting? And the best bit of advice I ever got is, uh, a meeting should be like the best Bond movie you ever saw. Okay. Now, that, now that sounds a bit weird, right? But let's think about it. 
a Bond movie, what does it do? It starts with an action sequence, right? So Bond is in a helicopter above Mexico City fighting a baddie. And, you know, it, it, the, the helicopter is going upside down and it's going all over the place. In, in the end, Bond kills the baddie, falls out the, the helicopter, he lands the helicopter. And the next bit, he's back in London talking to M, who's giving him a telling off. And the film starts. What's happened? It's got your attention. You're right in it. Where's this going to go? This is really interesting. That's how your meeting should start. Not with a helicopter above Mexico City, but they would, should start with a bang. They should start with something interesting. Don't start with, let's have a look at the figures from last month. Because people are going to go, oh, my God. Why didn't you send out the figures from last month before you started the meeting? Let's start the meeting with an interesting fact or a customer story or a product we're launching, something that's going to engage the audience in that room. And then let's make sure why we're having the meeting. Let's be sure of the purpose of the meeting. Let's be sure on the agenda of the meeting. If you've got introverts, we talked about those earlier, didn't we? Introverts versus extroverts. Introverts hate not having an agenda. It freaks them out. They want to know what we're going to do when we come into the meeting. So you need some sort of agenda. It might be not timed, but you need an agenda. You need the purpose for the meeting. You need to know who's going to be in the meeting. Normally meetings have too many people in. Steve Jobs was brilliant about saying, why are you in this meeting? Oh, my boss told me to come. Well, you don't need to be here. You can leave now. You know, you can pare down meetings. As a leader, here's a really good tip. Don't go to every meeting you're invited to. Go to the start. Go to the end. Don't go to it at all. Ask for the person who ran the meeting to come and tell you how it went and what the action outcomes were. So it's time. We don't get any more time as a leader. Think about how you're spending your time and think carefully. Great book on meetings, Patrick Lencioni, Death by Meeting. Fabulous book. Give you everything you need to know on running a meeting. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, there's a question came in a while ago from, from Michael. Um, what do you think is the most important sphere to be excellent at? I've been trying to find a place to slot that question in. Well, well, as a leader. Know, but yeah, being, being excellent at meetings, I think, and actually maybe broaden it a little bit. For me personally, it's all about focusing on your people. If you can be excellent at, at being with your people as walking a mile in their shoes and understanding where it's going, then... Um, then you're perfectly positioned to actually um, to, to, to let them run the business for you. Absolutely. I think you're right. I think the people skills are the big thing. And if you look at how much time you spend as a leader dealing with people issues, people development, growing your people, challenging your people, it should be a big chunk of your time. Yeah. Um, yeah, the yeah. other thing I, I, I would say to balance that is every leader I've worked with who's you know the head of a team or the head of an organization will not have every skill that we talk about. And the key thing about a leader is knowing to get that personal people alongside them with the complementary skills that you don't necessarily have in abundance. Yep. Um, that's really critical. I had somebody say to me the other day, I'd love to be a CEO one day, but I, but I feel I'm really good at strategy and finance. I'm not so good at the people stuff. And I say, well, the fact you've recognized that's great because you can start to grow that. But who would you have in your leadership team? You'd have somebody who's really good at that who'll complement you in those skills. Yep. And so look at any of the great leaders around the world. They don't have everything. Mm. And, you know, nor do I, nor do you, nor does the next leader. So uh, having a team again is so important around you. An early, early per or person I worked for early in my career said you should never recruit anybody that doesn't threaten you. Yeah, great advice. Great so, advice. Look, um, time is time is romping on, and there's there's one more, couple more bits I want to get into. A little bit on grit, because mm. you know your podcast called the Gritty Leaders. Mm. Um, I guess the reference there is to the bit of grit in the in in the oyster. Is that right? Where, where... <laughs> yeah, we wanted to have a you know as we do. <laughs> ben and I never agree on anything, um, so we wanted to have a bit of a bit of grit in there. And I think, you know, leadership is, as I said, it's tough. You've got to be really resilient. You've got to want to be a leader. You know, this is, this is tough stuff. It's a tough journey. Um, you've got to build up resilience. Um, passion and per perseverance for long-term goals is what um, Angela Duckworth, great TED Talk, great book, um, describes grit as. An awful lot out there about grit and resilience now. And we kind of, I think as leaders, we kind of feel we should have it, you know. Um, but we've got to be honest as well. And, you know, mental health is, is, a, is a big thing. 
Um, we've got to balance our lives. We've got to figure out how to get it. I mean, one of the things we talked about earlier, stepping outside our comfort zone, one of the things about becoming grittier and more resilient is we put ourselves slowly into more pressure situations and we come, yeah. it becomes easier to cope with them. I mean, you look at um, Emma Raducanu, who just won the US Open. My gosh, what a resilient girl. Absolutely outstanding. And why is that? Why is she so resilient? Well, she's probably been through this, this high stress all her life. Um, and then look I, at the lesson she learned at Wimbledon. Yeah, absolutely. And that was crucial because she knew at the time she had the, the self-awareness to go, stop, step back. And she clearly had a lot of people around her looking after her because for some people that would affect them deeply for a long period of time, but she bounced back relatively quickly and then she won the US Open. So resilience is something we've got noticed in ourselves, but the more we push ourselves, I mean, the kind of in our own time, and I've, I've talked about this, not everyone can push themselves massively at our own pace as well, the, the grittier we'll become. Um, but going back to Angela Duckworth's definition, long-term goals, if we really want to get something in our life, we tend to get through things on the way to that vision. And that goes back to why you should have a vision, because you can sit there with your leadership team and say, we said in three years' time, we want to be this big, this great, this bold, have these many products, these many services. Right, guys, how are we going to get there? And suddenly you find ways. You're creative. You move towards that. And things, and you get problems along the route. You get challenges along the route. And then you figure out how to overcome them because you will desperately want to get to that vision. And for people like Emma Raducanu and individuals, we need our own vision of where we want to go to. And the grit, the resilience we build up along the route and the care and attention and the people around us who support us. And we need all that really important as a, as a leader to notice that in your people too, you know, have, are they coping, especially now? So it's a big, it's a big deal, you know, this grit and resilience stuff and leaders need it in abundance. And I think that's, you know, if we're looking, if we want to look for, for the good things to come out of the pandemic and lockdown, I think, I think we've all become quite a lot more resilient. Yeah. We've we've learned how to handle things in a way that that we wouldn't have done before. So, yeah, yeah. grit grit's a really important one. Um, all right. So the the last sort of topic. We've only got a few minutes left. Mm. So you know maybe we've left the most important one till last, which is execution. Yeah. So the the the, the having the strategy, the having the right people. You know, getting everybody on the bus in the right seats. Um, if we don't actually turn the bus on and go somewhere, then then maybe we're you know, we're, we're missing something. Um, strategic priorities. Yeah. What are they? <laughs> well, uh, so I'll go back to having a, a session with a group uh, years ago. I ran a senior leadership team and I said, so I'm asked quite often to come and run sessions on, can we create our, our goals for next year? And I'd call them strategic priorities. And I say, yep, yeah, that's great. Can you send me in advance your purpose, your vision, your values, this year's goals, targets, measures, um, and historically what you've done over the last, say, five, six years, and then your leadership team, your capacity, your capability, uh, anything you've got on the market and how that's evolving and how that's changing. The last time you did a SWOT analysis, maybe a pestle analysis, maybe a Porter's Fire Forces, I want to know a lot of information before, because otherwise you're doing this in a kind of bubble. You're kind of, because what you're doing is saying, what are we going to do over a period of time? That's your strategic priorities. What are we going to do over a period of time? And unless you've got those things in place, you know, you, you do need to know what's happening in the market. You do need to know what your strategy is. You, know, you need to know what your vision is because that's what we want to go towards. Um, and if you've got all those things, and often when I run an away day with people, I, I, I get them all on the wall. I put all those things around the wall and say, look, there's our vision over there. Here's, here's, <laughs> here's last year's strategic priorities. This is what we've done over the last five years. These are the trends. And then you get people in the leadership team to have done a SWOT of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So we can look at our internal capabilities, the external market, the competition, and so on. Within that framework, we can now say, what do we want to do next year? We can have a creative session followed by something that starts to pin it down over several months that says, this is the big projects. These, these are the big markets we're going in to do. 
this is the new things we're going to create. These are the systems and processes we needed to underpin that. This is our people strategy, and these are the resources we need to bring in. So these are the what some people call the big rocks we're going to do next year. We need to know exactly what they are. We need to have a real plan about them. We need to have one person accountable for each of them. We need to have the right KPIs and measures behind them and right targets. And everyone on the senior leadership team needs to know ev what everyone else's is. So we, we, this is the key. It's not like, well, I only need to know marketing because I'm in marketing. Everyone needs to know everyone else so they can challenge and support. And of course, when you've got them created, you need to monitor them through your great meetings every month and quarterly. And then you need to cascade them and engage the whole organization in them so that they can join the dots from where they sit in the organization to the strategic priorities. And that's down to their team leader to help them understand what they do fits with where the business is going. And then they start to buy in and understand it and not see it as kind of disassociated from what they're actually doing. So complicated piece, so important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the, the key piece there that you were explaining it was was it's the link between the the ultimate vision and the person who has to do the work to, to achieve the vision. Yeah. So they they will help you achieve the vision, but they will also need to know what the vision is to know really whether they want to get on board. Uh huh. Without a vision, every road will take you there. It's that kind of you yeah. know we could just yeah. do something and it might be good, but may not take us where we want to go. Nice. Look, um, got loads more we could talk about. Um, I think I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. We're a few minutes away from from twelve o'clock. Uh, been fantastic, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. A couple of things I'd say, you know, some standout points um, for me was you know, one bit was that, that that you were saying start the meeting with a bang. Mm -hmm. um, you're right. So often we start meetings with a. Pff. <laughs> um, so that that was a fantastic one, um, and um, yeah, a whole bunch in there. A couple of minutes on resources. Where would you say people would go to to learn? You know, we had a question in from Laura, books, TED talks, podcasts, etc. I mean, we'll we'll put together a list of everything that's been researched, yeah. and we'll we'll make sure that gets out to everybody. Um, but what yeah. two or three resources? Well, um, Jim Collins. I'm a huge fan of Jim Collins, as, as you are, Jonathan. Um, buy Jim Collins's latest book, BE 2.0. It's fantastic. Uh, Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions, we talked about that, or Lencioni's The Advantage. TED Talks, if you're not into TED Talks, go and look at some TED Talks. They are just amazing. Um, Amy Cuddy's TED Talk, Brené Brown's TED Talk, um, Simon Sinek's TED Talk, there's loads of them out there. Um, podcasts, uh, just, just podcasts are great because they're, they're free, you know? um so a ted talk yeah. so there's some great stuff there okay so tell you what why don't how about if you can spare it you and i yeah. over the next few days we'll put together a, yeah. a reading list or a recommendation list and we'll try and pick out everything we've mentioned here and maybe a few more sure, and we'll then do. we can share that with everybody yeah um okay um so resources we've, we've done um is a challenging one for you one thing that you that, that people should do next week <laughs> become a better leader <laughs> so I wish on the basis was, there's no golden bullet i wish there was one thing you could do my my view is leaders uh as is one of your values have a growth mindset so what i would say is do do one thing it doesn't matter what it is if you go and buy jim collins's book and start reading it that i've recommended or if you go and watch uh, brenny brown's uh ted talk or amy cuddy's ted talk on presence um, or you download a podcast and listen to, you know, uh, Adam Grant uh, on on Brandy Brown's podcast. Um, do one thing. Get on get on that learning journey. Make sure you're accessing TED blogs, books, because to me, and you see, I'm passionate about this stuff. This is about your life. It will change your life. You'll, 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 just, you'll just understand more about who you are and what you can do with your life, never mind your business, which is what, of course, the outcome will be yeah. too. Very last thing, how can people get hold of you? Um, email ian at ianwindle.com or go on my website, ianwindle.com. Um, and yeah, just get in touch anytime. Love to hear from people. I'm sure you're on LinkedIn and then there's the, the Gritty Leaders yeah. Club, the podcast. And We've got the podcast and the blog. It's all, it's all accessible through my website. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Want to be respectful of everybody's time. So thank you, Ian, again. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Hope you found it useful. We will be sending out the podcast. I've committed us to sending you out a, 
a list of um, a list of resources. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much, and uh, see you soon. Thanks, Jonathan. Cheers, Ian.